Hi everyone. So, needless to say, it's been a bit of a hiatus and I'm coming back to this after a long, long time now. I, I actually don't even remember when was the last time I did one of these. Um, quite a few things happened in between which got me a little busy, a little worried, a little anxious. I bet a little bit of what everybody has been feeling off late. Um, a little homesick as well, I would say. So, um, I think I see a way forward for myself now. And uh, I thought it was a good time to come back to the book again. Because the chapter I'm about to read, although short, it does show Jilly in, in a light of um, taking control of her future of finding the next step forward that she can take so I will without further ado read um, go ahead and read this is chapter 6 of Thorny Hold by Mary Stewart and let's begin with what's the pencil sketch showing on this chapter so the pencil sketch here again is um, the same one as uh, the first chapter. So that's four pigeons kind of standing around, um, lots of feathers strewn on the ground. So they either had been cleaning or had a fight or something. But at this point, they just seem to be preening themselves. And with that, let's start the chapter. I followed Mrs. Trapp into the house. It must have been built at the same time as the great house. There were the graceful proportions of the 18th century, scaled down to the humbler requirements of the squire's agent. The hall was square, with doors opening off it to the left and right, and beyond the left-hand door a staircase with wide, shallow treads leading up to a broad landing. At the rear of the hall was a shallow archway through which a kind of minor hallway could be seen, with a tall window showing a glimpse of trees and skies, and to the right of this another door which led, presumably, to a drawing room. The floor was tiled and felt gritty underfoot, and the rugs were clearly in need of a good shaking. So much I saw before Mrs. Trapp set my cases down and hurried ahead of me towards a door covered with faded buyers, which was set back under the rise of the staircase. This way. Wait a minute while I put the light on. The passage is a bit dark if you don't know the way. Mind that rug, it's a bit torn. It'll be cosier in the kitchen. If I'd have known you were coming today, I could have got the sitting room done out. But first things first, so the bedroom's all done, and I must say it needed it, with her auntie being in bed there for a bit before she went to the hospital. It's very good of you, I was beginning again, but she cut me short. As if we could let you come all this way into a strange house and not have a fire lit and the bed aired as soon as we heard there was a Miss Ramsay coming to live. I said to Jessamy, he's my son. We'd better get straight up there and get things sorted out a bit for her, poor soul, or she won't sleep easy, the way things have been left. I mean, Miss Ramsay, the place is clean enough, that goes without saying, but it's been neglected lately, and you can see it. Here we are, the kettle's just nicely on the boil. The kettle looked, indeed, as if it had been on the boil for some time, but whatever the tea was like, I would be grateful for it. They say that to travel hopefully is better than to arrive. On the way down in the train I had been drifting in a dream, or rather towards the fulfilment of a dream. A house of my own, a garden, a wood to the very door. The picture cousin Galus had drawn for me years ago, lighted by sunshine and filled with flowers. I had not paused to consider that the reality on this sunless September day would be very different. I was only thankful that the solicitor's forethought had sent Mrs. Trapp to make some kind of preparation for my coming. 
She was busying herself with pot and kettle. There seemed to be supplies. She lifted an old-fashioned caddy down from the mantelpiece and spooned out the tea. A milk bottle, half empty, stood on the table. Soon be brewed, she was saying. Would you like a biscuit or a bit of toast, maybe? No? Then you won't mind if I have one myself? I brought a packet in. Beside the milk bottle was a quarter pound of butter, still in its wrapping, but partly used, a bowl full of sugar, a loaf also half used, and a packet of biscuits lay beside them. She took a biscuit and, munching, began to pour tea. There, now, if I didn't forget what I should have said straight away, how sorry I was about your poor auntie, my cousin. What? She wasn't my aunt. Miss Saxon was my mother's cousin. I always called her Cousin Galis. Oh, well, yes. There now, a very nice lady she was, and always very good to me. I did what I could looking after her. They say you need good neighbours in the country. A smile as if I should understand her readily. She had very pretty teeth. She chattered on, munching biscuits. She took three spoonfuls of sugar in her tea. I drank mine and looked around me. It was a big kitchen, old-fashioned, but well enough planned, and after the vicarage kitchen, a delight. Instead of a vast black eagle range, there was a cream-coloured agar nestling under the old mantelpiece as if it had been built with the house. This would not, I guessed, be the original kitchen. No 18th century servants would have been pampered with this light and present room. One window, the one with the dead plants, faced north. Another gave on the woodland beside the house. I could see little beyond a tangle of elderberry and rowan overhang. What looked like a shed roof and a tall chimney. The old wash house, perhaps. Possibly the original kitchen lay that way, concealed by bushes and functioning now as a scullery and outbuildings. Opposite the fireplace was a tall dresser with rows of pretty plates in white and powder blue with cups to match, hanging along the front of the shelves. The new fashion for built-in kitchen units and worktops had not reached so far into the wilds, it appeared. The big table in the middle of the room gave all the working space necessary, and there was another long table under the window, cluttered now with various boxes and jars and a pile of books, which had presumably been lifted down from a hanging shelf beside the window. I was just cleaning some of the bookshelves down. It's funny, isn't it? How do they collect that dirt? Mrs. Trapp set her cup down and got to her feet. And now you want to see a room? With all the air of a hostess, she ushered me out of the kitchen and back along the passage to the buyer's door. She swung my two cases up as if they weighed nothing, talked down my protest, waited while I gathered up handbag and coat, then led the way upstairs. She trod curiously light-footed on those thick legs, along the wide landing that ran the width of the hall. To either side of the landing, at the head of a shallow rise of three steps, was a door. She opened the one on the right. Beyond it lay a small square lobby, with a window facing us, and doors to left and right. She opened the door on the left and showed me into a bedroom. After what I had seen downstairs, the bedroom was a surprise. It was a big room with two tall windows giving on the back or south side of the house. In each was a wide window seat set in the depth of the wall. The fireplace was delicate with pretty flowered tiles. A bow-fronted chest did duty as a dressing table and a deep cupboard beside the fireplace stood open, showing the hanging room of a big wardrobe. The bed was doable, double and high. The carpet was a soft green, linking the room, as it were, with the woods outside. By one of the windows was an easy chair, a lovely room. True, the carpet was faded near the windows, the curtains had shrunk a little, and the fabric had begun to go rotten where the sun had caught it. There was a patch of damp in one corner, just below the cornice, and the faded wallpaper had begun to peel there. But the room was clean, 
It smelled fresh, and one of the windows was open at the top. The bathroom's next door, said Mrs. Trapp. She crossed to the nearest window and gave the curtain a twitch. I was reminded of the lace curtain at the lodge, and wondered who was there in her absence. But she was eyeing me, so I gave her what she was wanting for. It's lovely, I said warmly. I know I shall love being here. Thank you very much for getting it so nice for me, Mrs. Trapp. I told you. We wouldn't let you come in, the way it was. Not much done downstairs, there wasn't time. But the bed's well aired and the bathroom's done too. Want to see it? Later, thank you. I was wondering. I'm wondering how to ask what payment she expected for the work she had done. Possibly if they had asked her to clean for me, the solicitors might have seen to it. I put a harmless question. If you live at the lodge, it's an awfully long way to come up, isn't it? Do you have a car? I have a bicycle, but there's a short cut through the woods. I come that way usually. I gather you've been keeping an eye on the place since my cousin was taken ill. Did you work for Miss Saxon? Off and on. She liked her lonesomeness, but some spring I usually gave her a hand with the cleaning. Do you want to see the rest now? I'll unpack first, I think. But perhaps before you go you'll show me where all the kitchen things are and how to cope with the stove. All right, miss. But you don't need to bother about the stove. That's all set for the night. And I'll be up in the morning. And you don't need to worry about your supper, neither. There's something cooking in the oven. And I'll leave the bread and that for you. No bother. No need to worry about the rationing. There's always plenty to be got hereabouts. When you've known the folks as long as I have. And your auntie wasn't one for letting her cupboards go empty. It's terribly good of you. I did bring as much as I could, but... "'until I get to know about shops and registering for rations and so on. "'I can tell you where to go, and you can be sure you'll be treated right "'when they know you've got Miss Saxon's place.' "'She followed me down the stairs. "'That's it then, miss. "'I'll let you get yourself sorted out now, "'but I'll be up first thing more tomorrow morning, "'and I'll fetch the milk and something for your dinner too, "'so just you rest easy.' And we'll soon get the house readied up between us. You're very kind. I hesitated, but it had to be said I neither wanted nor could afford daily help in the house. Mrs. Trapp, it's terribly good of you, but you really mustn't bother about me. I know I'll need all the advice I can get about shops and rations and things till I get myself organized. But as for helping with the house, I, well, I... Plan to look after things myself. I'm quite used to it, and in fact, honestly, I prefer it. Like my cousin, I like my lonesomeness. I gave her a smile. But I'm really very grateful for what you've done, and of course I'll be very glad if you'll help me out from time to time, the way you did, Miss Saxon. It happened again. The scarlet flush rising swiftly up her neck and right over her face. And this time, with a curious inner lurch of nerves, I recognised it and knew why it had so disconcerted me, and why my dealings with her so far had been timid to the point of misgiving. I had seen someone blush like that before. My chief tormentor at the convent, in anger or in contempt when she had managed to make me cry, had looked like that, and the blue eyes, fixed like a doll's eyes in the suffused face had looked just the same. Through it she smiled, the white teeth flashing. Well, of course, it's just as you like, Miss Ramsay. But almost the last thing your auntie said to me before they took her to hospital was, Agnes, dear, this being such a big, roomy house, and all, oh, wouldn't it be great if you'd move in with me and look after me right here? The flush receded. She smiled again charmingly. And that's just what we was planning to do, Jessamy and me, when she took ill and died. But it's all different now, isn't it? I was not, repeat, not eight years old. And this was not the Führer of the third form. I was the owner of Thornyhold, standing in her own front hall, talking to the hired help. 
but I had to clear my throat before I could say, cheerfully, and I hoped firmly, yes, it's all different now. Thank you again, Mrs. Trapp, and goodbye. And that is the end of this chapter.